All right, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kay Martinez. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. I am the director of EDIJ Learning and Development at Lesley University, and I'm really excited and honored to welcome our keynote speaker, Representative Park Cannon, who's with us, uh, to engage in conversation with me today uh, and kick off a month of events here at Lesley uh, in honor of Black History Month. So I am just going to briefly introduce uh, Representative Cannon. I have a few questions that I've prepared and I will leave time at the end of our uh, session today for your questions. So if you uh, see this Q&A button, uh, please submit your questions that way and I will be sure to ask them. So let's get started. I wanted to just highlight a bit about Representative uh, Cannon's background for us. She is the youngest uh, elected official uh, in Georgia's uh, history. So she was elected uh, at 24. She is the first openly queer elected official in the United States. In 2021, uh, some of you may have maybe seen news stories uh, featuring Representative Cannon as she made international headlines when she was unlawfully arrested after knocking on a door of a closed door meeting where SB 202 was signed by Governor Kemp in Georgia. So we're gonna be talking a bit about that, uh, but thank you so much, Representative Cannon. Thank y'all for having me. It's actually a legislative day. It's legislative day 14. So I'm actually in my office in the state capitol, the same place where I was arrested. I've had to come back here every day and continue to work. So I am excited to talk with you about Black History Month and feeling like I'm a part of Black History Month, but also that there's so much more that I want to learn. So I hope this can be a little bit of a two-way street as well, where if you have any connections to Georgia or Atlanta, or you'd like to follow up with questions afterwards that you just drop it in the chat. Thanks so much. So let's get started. Uh, my first question for you is to tell us a bit about why you decided to run for office in the first place. It's a question that I've been answering since 2016, but I feel like the, the depth of it changes every time that I come across someone who is curious about if they should run for office or how I really did it. So I'd love to tell you that, first of all, I ran for office because I was very angry at the current political system. At that time, I was at my first job out of college and I was working at a reproductive health clinic. And I really felt like every day that I went to the clinic, I saw people receiving services that they needed and they wanted, but still lawmakers were challenging them. So people who had never been in their shoes and had never been in their circumstances were over here at the Gold Dome deciding whether or not they could have access to that clinic. So I started reaching out to my lawmaker and it turned out that she was awesome. She was a black woman, uh, identifies as lesbian, had kids in college. She was a part of direct actions. She had wrapped herself in caution tape at, on the state floor when they tried to take away access to abortion. And so she was great and I could you know, talk to her and ask her if she would sponsor this resolution or help deal with this issue. And I thought that she was gonna stay in office. And I ended up realizing that, you know, she didn't wanna do it anymore. So she called me and she asked me if I would run for office. She said she was vacating her seat. And so I had to really in a fast motion figure out, did I want to run? You know, did people want me to run? What things did I have? that others didn't have and how could I take, you know, fill her shoes. So it was a really quick election. You know, she resigned the week of uh, Thanksgiving 
and the governor called an election for January. So I had about six weeks to decide how to run for office. I had to figure out how to increase my name ID and do all my state filings and things. But ultimately, what I decided when I decided to run for office was that so many of the identities that intersect inside of me are not represented at the Capitol. You know, you spoke to a few of them. I'm super young. I was 24 at that moment. I have experienced homelessness. I grew up in a house with a lot of domestic violence. And, you know, I'm Black. I'm from the South. I've seen families struggle, my own family struggle. I identify as queer. And at that point in the United States, there had not been a single individual who had ever identified as queer openly. So I would become the first openly queer lawmaker in the United States. Now, maybe some people hadn't identified with that term yet because realistically what we knew in that moment was that a lot of people were um, still feeling as though queer was a derogatory term, which in many cases it was, you know, it was used really as a noun instead of as an adjective. And so as I started using it as an adjective and started coming into myself, I just realized that there were so many identities that I held that just were not represented. And if I could step out so that people could see that they'd have the opportunity um, to represent their communities too, then things might get better in my state because I was just really frustrated with the ways that they were taking away rights, um, reproductive rights and attacking voting rights and being xenophobic and not caring about young people, not funding public education. And so it was, it was a difficult decision. I still remember calling my best friend and telling her, and I remember sitting at um, pretty much the Thanksgiving day table and, and telling my family that I had made that decision. To Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, part of our focus for today is on voter suppression. So if you could explain to us what voter suppression is, and could you please tell us how SB 202 suppresses the vote for some communities in Georgia? Oh, Representative Kennedy, you're muted. Yep. Thanks. Thanks so much. And so it got so interesting last year. There were 78 voter suppression bills moving from the House to the Senate and from the Senate to the House. But what happens in the lawmaking process is you actually have to get your bill passed from one chamber to the other in the first 28 days. So day 28 is called crossover day. The bill has to cross over from one chamber to the other. So we had successfully made it through crossover day with 78 bills on voter suppression moving through the process. That was a lot of tracking. I am that millennial who loves a, you know, Google Excel. And so every time things change, I was, you know, moving things around. I also serve as a secretary for two different caucuses, the Democratic caucus, which has 78 members and also the Atlanta delegation, which has about 20 members. And so I was typing away, firing away, but we came in on legislative day 35. And all of a sudden, all of the 78 bills had been put into Senate Bill 202. So Senate Bill 202 was originally a two page bill. It literally had nothing in it. It was just a bare bones bill. And we realized that they were putting that bill through the process to have a vehicle legislation where they could exert everything, cut everything, and just paste in some new stuff. And so we, you know, went to bed on, you know, March 24th, and it was a two-page bill, and we woke up the next day, and it was a 98-page bill. It was in the Rules Committee, which is a committee that determines the rule of debate on the floor. And so are we debating it for an hour? Are we going to have questions on the floor? Can we amend it? You know, what's the rule of debate? So it was in the rules committee. 
and it passed out of the Rules Committee with narrow debate, narrow amendments allowed. It hit the House floor. We had that debate. It got immediately transmitted to the Senate. The Senate immediately took it up and passed it. And this is just so unusual. The, the bill making process is normally vetted by each county who determines their elections. You know, Fulton County, the county I serve is the state's largest. We have millions of people in it. But there are other counties where there's only a hundred voters. And so each of those counties has to weigh in and say, if you say that we can or cannot use this type of funding, this will impact our provision of elections. Or if you say that these are now felonies or misdemeanors, we have to have peace officers, as we call them in the state. We have to have officers who are there to effectuate arrest or so many different considerations really needed to be made. And instead, this bill just ran through the process. So as a minority, you know, we were scrambling back and forth. We were trying to get the word out to the media. And we were trying to talk about what Senate Bill 202 was, you know, going on and, and, and what was really happening. So we tried to break down for people the top three things that Senate Bill 202 did and how this is linked to this idea of voter suppression. So the first thing that it did was it decided that the Secretary of State, which is an elected position, that they could actually remove any local election board that they wanted and replace it with an appointee of their own. So like in Fulton County right now, we're struggling with the fact that we've had so many different things go on now that Georgia has turned blue and many individuals are saying, oh no, there was meddling in the election. They lied, they cheated. They didn't really get it right. Part of this big lie. And so what they'll do is they'll say, we're gonna take away the people at the local level who decided that you could use mail-in ballots and you could vote you know, um, in your early polling places or you could vote provisionally and cure your ballot afterwards. So many ways that if the secretary of state who has no clue what's going on in these local counties decides they're gonna remove the people who actually know and appoint someone. I mean, that's just outright overreach of power. And the second thing that it does is it adds felonies and misdemeanors to the voting code. So now we were realizing, you know, people were voting in a pandemic. So sometimes people were coming there hungry, tired, you know, thirsty. Lines were long. In one of my polling places, we had a six hour line in order to vote because of poor voting machines and poor systems. And so, Organizations, mostly nonprofits like Black Voters Matter, um, New Georgia Project, even some of just like the women's civic leagues or school groups, they were coming and they were bringing pizza, you know, and they were bringing water and, and bringing chairs to people in line. They made it through Senate Bills 202 a misdemeanor if you give people food or water in line. And so this really you know, teased at the way that voter suppression can be about taking away people's human rights to have basic necessities met while they are effectuating their constitutional duty. And so then the third thing that it really did, which this is really, the, I believe the most egregious part was that it determined that now that elections are run by counties and that counties have to, you know, use their funding in certain ways that no county would be able to refuse someone challenging another person's voter registration. And in fact, people can put in an unlimited number of contests against someone's voter registration. So you're like, why does this matter? So in Georgia, of course, as you can understand, we're browning. We've been browning for years. And there have been many people of Black and Brown communities who just weren't able to successfully effectuate their vote because of intimidation in these rural counties where people will say, oh, you're going to vote, or they'll be watching the lines, or they'll have their long guns, you know, at the polling places. So 
when people are now deciding like, okay, I'm gonna register to vote and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna vote. And maybe their last name, it could be Jenkins, you know, or it could be El Said. It could be Lopez. It could have a hyphen to it. It could have, you know, multiple letters to it. It could be from a different background. So we started to see that these local counties were having these um, voter suppression fanatics who are going through the voter registration rolls and who are saying, oh no, I don't think LCE lives in this community. Oh, I don't think they live in this community. And so then they submit these to the local board of elections and say, send them a subpoena to come up to the registration um, desk and prove that they live in this county. You might not get that piece of mail, even if you did get that piece of mail. Thinking that now you have to go, you've already shown your government IDs, you might have already even voted. You might have been voting for years, or this might be your first time. And so now you have to go and do these litmus tests the same way that before they would make it so that you'd have to prove, you know, that you could read a certain amount or you could write a certain amount, these literacy tests, these literal ways that they effectuated Jim Crow laws. So now this is all happening again. And these unlimited number of contests against black and brown voters registrations is happening. And so now people are being purged from the voter rolls for not coming up to these local counties and basically proving everything about themselves. It's been really emotional at times to hear people call our office and to say, I've been voting. I don't know what's happened to my registration and I don't want to go you know, back to these places. I know that it's hostile. Or they'll call us and they'll say, can you come with me? You know, have you, can you send paperwork that, you know, talks about my character? And this is people's just basic constitutional right to vote. So tying all that into this idea of voter suppression, I think it's really about realizing that there are a multitude of ways that systems of inequity will show you that they don't value your input on what they're doing. And in fact, what they'll do is they'll make it so difficult for you that you'll disengage and that you won't be able to decide what really happens. And for me, every vote counts. So I, I really hope that we can get to that part of the question. Thank you. So let's get to that part of the question. So uh, you mentioned voting. Uh, so let's talk about voting a little bit. Why do you encourage people to vote? Uh, you know, as a millennial, as someone from the South, as a person who just started voting very soon before I decided to run for office, I at times have also felt like, why engage in this system? Especially when they're showing us that the people who are in office don't care and aren't moving out of the way. So I'd like to start off by, you know, telling the story of my first election and then kind of go a little, maybe a little bit more philosophical, if you might say. So my first election, like I told y'all, it was considered a special election. Special meaning that it didn't happen in the normal primary season or in the general election season. It was all out the blue. Anyone could jump in the race and anyone did. There were you know, a total of three candidates. So ultimately I had to prove to about 25,000 voters that they could trust a 24 year old um, person to be their state representative, to go up to the Capitol, to balance the budget, to pass all these bills. And on the campaign trail, every single day people told me, you can't do this, you're too young. And I'd have to tell them, no, you have to be 21 to run for the house, I'm 24, I'm too old to not be running. So I would have to really push people back and forth on what does it take to be qualified to run for office? But 
as I made it through that process, I started to actually see that there were so many people's doors who I knocked that really cared about what their say meant and that they understood that they might want to engage in one type of election, but not another type. And actually, there are super voters who love special elections like this. They want to be the one who votes in two out of three elections. They want to be the, you know, vote tie-in person, the, the, the tie breaker, um, if you may have it. And so as I started knocking these doors and getting some energy, I was realizing that communities that vote, this is their say, this is their voice. So how am I, you know, and how are others to decide, well, I'm just not gonna engage. I just, I can't do it. And so we started going forward with the campaign and we get to election day. There are 22,000 eligible voters. 1,000 people showed up. So when I got 668 votes, I became the top vote getter in the election. The second two individuals, they just got a few hundred votes each, which broke down to 47.9% for me. And I'm gonna put it in the chat. And then, you know, 14% for someone else in the balance for someone else. So no one actually got over 50.1% of the vote, which is what you have to have in order to win outright. But the spread of votes between 47.9% and 50.1% was 23 votes. 23 votes. There's more of us on this Zoom call than what it would take to elect a state representative and a queer one and a progressive one and a young one. Why not engage in a system where, especially in special elections and in you know, other types of elections too, we can gain some systemic power is how I felt and how I still feel to this day. So we got to that special election, but because I didn't get those 23 votes, I had to have a runoff a runoff election is basically the top two vote getters have to do a whole nother campaign and then have to go to election day. So it took a whole nother month. And legislative session in Georgia is only January through April. So it was already February. So District 58 had no one representing them at the Capitol for over a month and a half at this point. If 23 more people had voted, I would have been voted in in January. But I did win the election in February and immediately got sworn in. So I started to see the power of literally every vote counting. And so when people started coming up to the state capitol, when Stacey Abrams ran for governor in 2018, and they were saying, count every vote. Do not allow for voter suppression to change people's registrations or take them off the voting rolls or say that they have a misdemeanor or felony now because they gave food and water line, all these things. These were real issues that people were holding their communities on their back for. So for me, the first part of why vote is because truly every vote counts. And I saw it in my election and I've seen it in other elections. This past election cycle, and two election cycles passed. There were elections in Georgia for county commission seats and city council seats and mayoral seats that were decided by one vote. The city of Atlanta for the past two election cycles before this one, which has millions of people in it, its election for mayor was decided by 800 votes. So for me, it's a numbers game and I hope that in some ways there's some mathematics folks on here. There's some like analytics and data folks on here who are just eating this up and who love this. But if that's not your, you know, MO, if that's not moving you, I understand too, because I'm a member of the movement for black lives. I always have been. I still run with a lot of people who say, Park, you're awesome, but I'm not voting. And I'm not voting for you because I want to divest from this entire system. I'm not interested in any of the interests that come out of that system. In fact, I want a whole new system. 
I want a black feminist future or whatever it may be called. And I love that and I appreciate it. And so I don't take away from folks who have that feeling and have that deep guttural stance. I don't take it lightly. And I don't think that as young people, it's always been so effective when older folks or folks within our community have, will say, people have bled and fought and died for your right to vote. Well, why don't you just do it? You know, going in this like guilt realm. I really don't think it's moved people. In fact, I think it's pushed people further away because they see the perils of engaging with the system that could, you know, bring them harm. And then fast forward, you know, people saw me get drug out of the state capitol last year for simply knocking on the governor's door when he's taking away all these rights. So I set all that up to say that I really do hear people. I understand where people are coming from. And I almost applaud people for going through those mental decision making points to say, like, I'm not I'm not doing this. But I think that's categorically different than folks who have just decided I'm not going to do the work to restore dignity and justice to my community who have said, I don't care what happens to the old lady who needs her roof fixed. And I don't care if the government pays for it or if there's a nonprofit who will pay for it or who will say, I'm just not even worried about the young people and you know public schools and whether or not they have technology. I can't get with all of that. I'm having a a real, you know, come to Jesus sometimes moment with people about, well, then what are the other solutions that we have? And, and I, if there's people in the chat here who feel like, you know, they have that understanding of, of how we build that, I ask for you to start on it. Otherwise, I have to push back a little bit and say, you know, philosophically, do we run ourselves into the ground? I was on the campaign trail and on the same ballot as Bernie Sanders, who had a number of supporters, many of y'all may know, who were on the Bernie or bus movement. It was like Bernie or nothing. And so where do we find ourselves for folks who are in the bus movement? Where do they plug into the system or how is their circumstances improved? Because I know that for the folks who were a part of that Bernie or Bus movement, a lot of them in Georgia, many of them have now decided that they are running for office. And so my only thought for folks who are like, I'm not voting for the reasons that I illuminated, I would like to ask y'all if there's literally no one who you would ever vote for. If there's a school board race, the person who gets to determine dress codes or if bathrooms are gender neutral, would you really never vote for someone who is queer or trans to be leading that conversation? Would you rather a homogenous group of rural men decide that over and over as history continues? Or would you say, I'm gonna go and I'm, I see there's all these races but I'm not interested in those races. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna vote for that race and I'm gonna take myself home. And I'm gonna invest in that one elected official and I'm gonna work on that one issue that I truly care about. I really, and I'm gonna close this part of like my philosophical thoughts on voting, but I really see voting as a practice. I don't see it as an end. I see it as how you might have to go to soccer practice, change up your kick, I'm a dancer, so I have to go to dance practice. I'm a little more sore sometimes than other times. Sometimes I can't turn the right way. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes the studio, you know, the person is late or maybe I'm late. The music is faster, the music is slower. I have to be able to be nimble and flexible enough to address those things. And so when you think of voting as a practice, you wanna be in the game. You wanna see what's going on. You wanna see has a polling place changed? And for people to know that you know that that polling place changed because then you'll get there to the church and be like, oh no, this was never a polling place. Yes, it was. I voted here three weeks ago. I voted here in the special primary. And now I'm here for the runoff. And you're telling me that I can't vote here 
and I need to go over to another polling place. So knowing, you know, these parts of it and practicing how we engage with it, I think is more powerful than just turning off the lights altogether. I would, you know, urge that if people are around you who are feeling apathetic or who have faced negative consequences for voting, put them in touch with me. Let's talk and let them know that I really am going to hear them out. And I really do understand that guttural stance, but I'm also looking for a representative democracy. And the way that we get to representative democracy, meaning one that has the identities of those who are in the body represented in the person who goes up there, then we've got to get more people who have locks elected. If we had more folks who had locks elected like me, probably the Crown Act would have passed by now. And all this discrimination on hair in the military would probably be changed. A representative democracy that used to always just mean homogenous groups of the same people only can change when the people who need to be represented vote. So thank you for letting me go deep in. I really appreciate the soapbox. Well, thank you so much for sharing your philosophical and practical perspectives. Uh, you are up for re-election right now. You represent District 58, and I understand that the districts have changed a little bit. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about, or ask you <laughs> to talk about uh, gerrymandering and redistricting. So what are these terms uh, and how are they being used to target certain communities? Yes. So Every 10 years, folks around the United States complete the census. The census says, we're here. These are our backgrounds. This is where funding needs to go. I recognize that there have been political debates on whether the census should be in other languages or whether we need to know people's immigration status in order to complete the census. And I appreciate and have done hard on the ground work with Spanish speaking communities and Portuguese speaking communities this past year to be inside of the questioning of when I fill out this paperwork, are the police really not going to come here? And so I ground this conversation on redistricting, not with what us legislators are doing but with what the people have already done. So the census, as y'all know, is already completed. Step two of that is the federal government sending each state its new numbers. The state of Georgia went up over a millions of people. So who's gonna represent them? As I told you before, there's about 22,000 voters in my district, but I represent about 58,000 people. Many of those are children or folks who are not on the voting rolls. But now in our new districts, because of population change, I'll represent over 60,000 people. So as I go to figure out who those people are, I don't get to choose. Those people already said, I live here. This is my community. These are my schools. This is my hospital. So each state gets to determine how they're going to do their redistricting process, but in the state of Georgia, it's lawmakers do it. Basically a bill is written that says, these are your new maps. And it's normally written by the majority party. I am in the minority. And a state agency called the reapportionment office. That took place this past November before Thanksgiving. So normally, like I said, we're in session from January to April, but we got called into a special redistricting session this past year. We were here for about two weeks and in two weeks, 11 million people were split up into 180 districts. What we saw was that 
my district, which is on this map over here. And I was this kind of green area here is now this pink district over here. So inside of those districts are different polling places, different communities of interest. And if you looked at the shapes of the maps that I just showed you, you probably wouldn't call it a square or a circle. You might say it's like a L or a spread out Y or a doohickey because that's what gerrymandering is. It is taking communities of all different backgrounds and putting them all into one district, either cracking away communities of interest, saying like, oh, there was a lot of Latino vote over here. So like, let's take a piece of that out and like move it to that district. And then let's put some of it in over here or packing. Oh, these are like five high black polling precincts are like super democratic. Let's put them all together. And the goal of that is to dilute political power. For example, if you have a district, like the districts when Stacey Abrams were running for office, remember we're trying to get to 50.1 on a vote. If you have a district that is either 50.8% or 50.2%, it makes a world of a difference as to how people are actually able to change a district. We call it flipping districts. You know, the way that Georgia turned blue was we flipped a lot of local elections. We got new people elected. We got 17 people elected one year. And so this redistricting process, it really takes away autonomy of the folks who filled out the census. And it just determines whatever the majority decides. And it's literally called Gary Mandering because there was a guy named Gary and he was drawing districts that looked like salamanders. So they called it Gary Mandering. And in Georgia, it has been devastating because the third part of this process is what we're in right now and why I'm at the state capitol today. It's because now we do our local redistricting. So our county commissioners, the people who determine your healthcare budgets, and your voting budgets and some of your jails, like your local jail, like the jail that I went in. And your school boards, the people who determine dress codes and how much money goes towards certain books and which books are allowed to be read and which extracurricular programs people have. Their districts have to be redrawn as well inside of these state districts. So right now what we're seeing is the worst attack on democracy through redistricting. And it's so convoluted that I'm breaking it all down so that y'all can be credible messengers for the rest of your lives on the redistricting process because it will happen over and over unless we get independent redistricting councils, which some states have. And there's been some issues with those two, but generally it's been better than partisan lawmakers coming in and saying, no, I want the Chevron in my district. No, the Wendy's in mine and the church and everything. But What's happening is when you decide to do redistricting of your local county, you put a local bill that only the members in your local delegation get to vote on. Like I told you in the secretary of the Atlanta delegation. So, you know, we don't have to redraw the city of Atlanta, but it's within Fulton County. So we're redrawing the Fulton County maps. So as a delegation of like 20 members, we decide like which commission districts and we help you know, talk to the locals and see what they need. Instead of believing in that process, the majority has taken our local bills and made them general bills and decided to put new maps on them. So the people who are going to elect the new members of these areas have zero say, which would have come from us. So this attack on redistricting it's like gerrymandering 2.0. It's like we've done it at the state level. Now let's really meddle in the local measures and let's like take black people off of these county commissions and let's draw two members together so that they have to run against each other and it becomes contentious. It's really targeting communities of color 
communities that were in ways moving out of negative systems of policing. You know, I'll close by saying there's been this conversation about defunding the police. And I've had to think about it long and hard. You know, when I got arrested, it was by the state police, the Capitol Police. So those individuals were supposed to be there to protect me, but they drug me out instead. If I have felt like I had been protected by those individuals in that moment, would it have been cost effective for them to even have been there? Because why would I have, why would they have needed to be there otherwise, unless they were there to effectuate arrest? On the other side, you see people talk about, well, what about public safety? You know, what about the gangs and how are we going to bust up the gangs? And all I want to say about the defund the police movement is that what communities are uprising to say is that policing as it is has cost us too much fiscally and also with our lives. So something has to change. So whether or not people think it's a bad marketing move to keep saying defund the police, there are so many other pieces that are inside of it that I really believe that if communities aren't targeted by redistricting and gerrymandering, they would be able to say in this locality, this is how we used to do community policing. And this is how it worked. And these are the ways that we wanna put in different types of community responder models. You can have, if you have a, a law enforcement officer and you need to effectuate an arrest, for a certain reason, okay. But what if someone's just going through a mental health crisis? Why wouldn't you have a co-responder model where you have a mental health professional there with them? These are the things that redistricting like mine pack and crack away. And so I hope that you'll be engaged in your redistricting process in your state, which is probably happening right now or over the next few months. Thank you, Representative Kinnon. I feel like this is the most informative civics lesson I've ever had. Uh, I need to add these uh, topics to Schoolhouse Rock to uh, like voter suppression and uh, gerrymandering. So thanks for breaking that down. I don't feel like I've ever really been taught this. Uh, and so now, since we have like just over 15 minutes left, I'm going to ask you the questions that have been submitted uh, via audience. And folks, if you'd like to submit your question, I ask that you use the Q&A button. It's just easier for me to see them. Uh, I think some people put some questions in the chat, but I can't scroll all the way back up there. So, all right, let's keep it moving. Uh, okay. When you were describing uh, when you decided to run for office, right? You're talking about how you're sitting at the Thanksgiving table and you were thinking about like telling your family, uh, so the question is, when you told your family you planned to run for office at Thanksgiving, how did they respond? And who has sustained you as a part of your support network? Awesome. So my family was shocked. You know, I've always been the little girl who had a lot to say. If you go to my Facebook page, there's a video of me in elementary school talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and I got his date of death wrong, but I was in there. So my family was used to me being willing to take up space. Like I said, I, you know, danced my whole life. And so I'd be on stage, you know, performing and always willing to, you know, share what I was feeling, but they didn't know that I believed in this government system. They didn't know that I wanted to become proximate. So it kind of came out of left field. They kind of thought maybe she'll go into being a news anchor or, you know, a, a, just a public speaker, a keynote speaker, a, a motivational speaker. But to actually decide that I was going to invest in an inside outside game, they were worried, you know, they were like, well, you know, this definitely elevates your profile, you know, and, and changes your level of anonymity to be a young black girl in the South with something to say. How are you going to do this? Who is gonna be on your team? We don't know how to run a campaign. 
we've never gotten elected to office. So they started to just get into their networks. And there are plenty of organizations that can help you run for office, both with boots on the ground and volunteers, like labor unions um, and then nonprofit organizations. And then there are also PACs, political action committees, that will give you money and fund you to do these things. So one of the PACs started telling me, and I can break down PACs, now PACs are bad. But, um, there was one pack that told me early money is like yeast. It makes the dough rise. And I was trying to figure out like, what do y'all really mean about that? Because if you're telling me I need to go to my broke college friends right now and ask them for money, you're saying that early money is going to make the dough rise. I don't believe you. And I started to realize that on a campaign, you have call time. Call time is you calling the people in your phone and saying, hey, I've got a grassroots campaign. This money is going towards five yard signs. If you can donate $5 in the next month, you will be able to help me get two yard signs. And then you be quiet and you wait and you listen and people are, you know, people have, oh, oh, can't do it right now, you know, or whatever. Or they're like, sure. So dispelling this idea in real time for my family members that it was possible, I think was the most important part of them sticking with me on the campaign trail. Then they started to reach out to their networks and they were willing to give a little bit of money. And before we knew it, we were reaching out to other elected officials because they had voted for those elected officials or they had been to a campaign event or they were elected in another state. And then, you know, I had so many different kind of catchy parts of my campaign. We decided to make my logo glasses because we wanted to say forward thinking and looking out for you. We didn't want to do stars and stripes and a flag and, you know, government stuff. So people were starting to find ways to get into the campaign and we were hosting fundraisers at drag shows and we were doing it all. Um, yoga session fundraisers on Zoom and it just became really fun for my family. So I think that for folks who are considering running for office at some point, first find out when you're allowed to run. Like in Pennsylvania, you can be 18 with no legal degree and become a judge. You just have to get elected. Here in the state of Georgia, you can be 21 and become a house member. I would love someone to replace me as the youngest member. Come on. But the systems make it seem like, oh, you gotta be at the end of your career and you gotta retire and you gotta have all this long money. You really don't. Um, that was kind of the part of me running for office. Thanks so much. All right, uh, some other questions we've gotten. Do you think we need to aim for a shift towards a, and this is in quotes, true democracy instead of a democratic republic? Ooh, academia in the building. Um, What I'll say, honestly, to that question is that as a member of the movement for Black Lives, I have seen divesting square up beside investing. And I think that government systems that choose investing over and over and over historically gain power. I want to see us have successful systems of divesting. And we've seen some examples of it throughout the civil rights movement. You would see, you know, the black dollar circulate three times before it went out. But for some reason, those things have stopped. I think that, you know, two pieces I can see is one, people felt like, oh, this is hard work. I have to go to work. I can't. I'm trying to build a life. I cannot focus on all that out there. I'm going to let them just go ahead and handle it. Like, I'm just going to choose ap apathetic route. And then others who have said, I'm leaving. I mean, people have literally changed countries, changed zip codes to try to persuade themselves that things were better. Um, 
And so until I feel like I see us have a stronger system of divestment, like being able to, when I vote on the state budget, make an amendment that actually takes away money from prisons and puts it into mental health or actually, uh, you know, takes money away from investigative units that use no-knock warrants and kill people. Um, I think it's going to be really difficult for us to make a change to a true democracy. I don't, I don't yet see it. Thank you so much. Yes, we are an academic institution, so I appreciate the philosophical questions that we generate. Uh, okay, so next question submitted. A story came out yesterday saying that about half of Americans think future elections will be overturned. Do you think that is highly possible or is this fear resulting from last year's attempted insurrection? Now, before I answer that, Representative Cannon, I was multitasking uh, as you were speaking just to look up this uh, reference because I had not heard of it. So I'm always learning uh, here from students and my community. So that's uh, an article I found referencing this uh, statistic. So that piece comes from CNN. So it says a growing number of people lack confidence in American elections. So any immediate responses to that? And thank you for the question submitted. Yeah, I like this article. I see it. I'm looking at it in real time as well. Ooh. Hmm. Oh, it even breaks it down after the insurrection. <laughs> Talks about the insurrection. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I get this. I get why. I'm seeing it in real time. We're finding people who have made it really clear that they've done what they feel like they could do in certain races and in certain seats. And this big lie has clouded massive wins that we rightfully would have had. I still wholeheartedly believe that Stacey Abrams won the 2018 election. The person who was the secretary of state, he was overseeing his own election to become the governor against Stacey. And he's now the governor. So, I think there has been a level of inside trading, internal movement that takes away people's confidence. I totally get it. Which is why when I got elected and you know, people were like, oh, you're the youngest, this is great. What are you gonna run for next? I was like, why are y'all asking me to run for something different? I literally just asked 55,000 people to put their trust in me to do this. So I think that the, political aspirations that people have sometimes can be really dangerous to our democracy. When in real time, people are saying, no, we elected you to do a thing and that thing isn't even done yet. Why would you move on? Even after my arrest, you know, people were saying, wow, you have a national spotlight. It's even international. You're gonna run for Congress. You're gonna run for the mayor. And I had to help people understand that for me, the most important thing was making sure I still had the trust of people in my district, but even more so being on my game with constituent concerns now. Because they're gonna say, oh, I have time to go on CNN, like many elected officials do, but I don't have time to deal with their unemployment claim that's clogged up in the system so they have no money for their food and their lights. Um, the political aspirations that I have seen happening around me over my five years of being elected, it's made me, not love some of this system too. So yeah, I can I can totally see that. And then, the, you know, the last thing I'll say about as it relates to like overturning elections, when you tell someone that they have three options of voting, you know, here, there, or later, most time people do it there or later you see a lot of voters don't turn out early. 
we're trying to grapple with and do some polling on. If it's because people feel like they want to be the vote tie, like, you know, the tiebreaker, they want to, you know, make sure that they're the last vote in and, and split the election, or they don't really know if the candidate is going to take off a mask at the end and, oh, I'm not voting for them anymore. I, they posted this crazy thing on social media. Or if it's really just that there's so much pent up energy, um, almost post-traumatic stress when it comes to trying to engage with this system that people are like, I just want to like do it right at the end when everyone else is doing it so I can just be an anomaly. And as we poll, you know, we'll post out and things on it, but I can get, I, I can get with this art, what this article is getting at. Um, it's a dangerous time in our democracy. Thank you so much. So we have five minutes left. It's a lightning round here. Uh, I'm going to combine these two questions that have been submitted, and then we'll probably just wrap up. Uh, okay, so a question submitted, what were your majors in college, and what experiences did you have in college that you think are helping you in your current role? So that's the first question. And then the second one is, uh, if you had one thing to say to young people who want to run for office, what would it be, especially young LGBT people or BIPOC folks? I know it's a lot in a little bit of time. So whatever you feel compelled to respond to. I got you. it. I am that secretary. I'm that millennial. I took my notes. My little scribble scrabble is looking great over here. Um, I was at first a dance major, darling. I was studying um, dance at Chapman University. And I decided to take some time off. I actually had a hate crime happen to me in college. There were some individuals who just felt like I didn't belong there. So they knocked on my door and decided to write the N word multiple times on it. And, you know, after that, I just had to take some time. So I came back to Atlanta, started working at the mall and um, got a little mental health about myself and decided to transfer to UNC Chapel Hill where I did graduate with two majors and a minor. I did Hispanic linguistics because many colleges did not have Hispanic linguistics programs which is really all the dialects of Spanish speaking countries and then linguistics, the study of language. I was deeply hopeful to go to law school. So I felt like I could set myself up for law school by knowing words <laughs> and knowing you know, the derivations. And I did a minor in women and gender studies. The women and gender studies minor is absolutely what has impacted my time in office. I bring a black feminist lens to pretty much anything. Any room that we're in, I'm thinking about, is this, you know, structurally racist? You know, if there's accessibility concerns, if people say, you know, little comments, you know, we walk into a room and they're like, hey guys. And I'm like, this is mostly folks who are femme or who identify as women. How would you like it if I walked into a room of folks homogeneously like you and said, hey gals. But, you know, in seriousness, it's helped me to just be more of an on the spot critical thinker. I feel like my college experience, I was able to decide that my lived experience equaled subject matter expert. I didn't need to be at the end of my career to run for office. In fact, I wrote a book, which if you DM me, I will send you for free. You just have to pay for the shipping because United States Postal Service is not free, but it's a three-part book and it's called The Universal Guide to Running for Office. I put it out on inauguration day last year because when I ran for office, there wasn't no guide. People were like, do whatever you feel like works. And so I break down a little bit more about why I decided to run for office. I've got some quotes about it. In the middle, I talk about how you do it, you know, what do you need? Who are the staff members you need? I talk about it as members of your kitchen cabinet. So just like you have spices in your cabinet, you've got your pepper, 
you know, that's your spicy person on your campaign. Someone comes out and elbowing you, they'll elbow back so you don't have to. Uh, your time, the person who keeps your time, keeps your schedule. Your all season salt, it's your Lowry's. You know, that's the person who's your campaign manager. They'll do anything. They'll put out a yard sign and they'll go on a press conference. Your cinnamon, that's your media person. The person who has like a little twang to you. They can give a high level update of your campaign and plug your events and not get too racy with the media. And then the last part is an affirmation series. I take you on a 120 day affirmation series with me where I say things like, um, I'm ready for this journey. And you can write yours in at the bottom. My favorite one though, is I'm gonna have that bubble tea. Cause sometimes on the campaign chill, you're like, I'm too busy. I'm not stopping to take care of myself. And so, um, you know, running for office and, and realizing that the experiences that I've had, you know, in college, they were enough. In fact, they're so relevant. How do we, how do we legislate Uber and Lyft with legislators from rural counties who don't even have it? You need a millennial at the table to be like, no, a penny tax is racist because, you know, it'll, a percentage tax is racist because it'll impact, you know, higher on folks who are low income than a flat fee that, you know, would be more factually consistent. So what do I say to, you know, folks who might consider running for office? Yes, I would love for you to order several copies for your library. I'm sure Kay can help set that up. But what I say for you is know that the stories that you have in your lived experience, you can bring to the campaign trail and start writing those stories down now. I learned one quick trick and I've been using it this whole time, which is anytime someone asks you a question, go to a story. People stay with you a little bit more when they're trying to get to know you and they might consider believing in what you're saying a little bit more. So I hope that you will get a copy of this book and I hope that you'll start writing down your stories so that you can do an effective campaign. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate y'all. I'm so happy that I could celebrate Black History Month, Super Bowl weekend, and Valentine's Day with y'all, all in one little piece. If you ever come down to Georgia, please reach out to me and I would love to be a part of your career. Well, thank you so much, Representative Cannon. Uh, if y'all could join me in thanking uh, our keynote speaker, folks are sending you some messages in the chat. Um, as I said, we have a list of great programming coming up this month in honor of Black History Month. I just put in the chat a couple scrolls up, uh, an event we have in two weeks featuring a panel of BIPOC Leslie alum. Uh, it's co-organized with our awesome Office for Career Services. So to look at all of the events we have this month, please check out the Leslie events calendar. So with that, Thank you again, Representative Cannon, for uh, spending your time with us today and educating me and uh, all of us on these really important topics that are happening right now. And I want to wish everyone a really great weekend. Uh, and thank you again. <laughs>